remarked yesterday that what is to be said here about theosophical moral principles and impulses should be built on facts, and for this reason I tried to bring forward a few historical facts that clearly demonstrated moral impulses. With the example of Francis of Assisi, it is clear that enormous moral impulses must have been at work in order for him to have been able to do the deeds that he did. For what kind of deeds were they? They were deeds that demonstrated morality in the very highest sense of the word. Francis of Assisi was surrounded by people afflicted with very serious diseases, which the rest of the world at that time did not know how to cure. The moral forces that streamed out from him did not merely give comfort to their souls, though certainly in many cases that was all that could be achieved, but also had healing, health-giving effects for those with sufficient faith and trust. Now, to understand more deeply the origin of the moral impulses of such an outstanding personality as Francis of Assisi, we must ask ourselves how it came about that he could develop such forces. What took place with him? To understand what was active in the soul of this extraordinary human being, we must cast our gaze somewhat further afield. Recall that in the ancient civilization of India, the people were divided into four castes, and that the highest of these was the caste of the Brahmins, the cultivators of wisdom. The separation of the castes in ancient India was so strict that the sacred books, for example, could be read solely by the Brahmins and not by members of the other castes. The members of the second caste, the warriors, could not read but only hear the sacred doctrine contained in the Vedas or in the epitome of the Vedas, the Vedanta. Footnote, footnote number 13 in the, in the book. The Vedas, or Veda equals word or knowledge, are four collections, Samhitas, of sacred hymns and oblational verses composed composed in ancient Sanskrit, the Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda, and Atharva Veda. In a broader sense, the Vedas also include the expository texts, the Brahmanas, the Aranyakas, and the Upanishads. The Vedanta, uh, parentheses, end of the Vedas, those parentheses, consists primarily of the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutras, commentaries on the Upanishads, and the Bhagavad Gita, part of the epic poem, the Mahabharata. The Vedanta is the basis of Hindu philosophy and religion. End of footnote 13. The Brahmins alone were allowed to explain or interpret any passage from the Vedas. Anyone else was strictly forbidden to have an opinion about what was contained in the sacred books. The second caste consisted of those in the military profession and those involved in governing the country. Then there was a third caste of those responsible for trade and commerce, and also a fourth, a laboring caste. Last of all, however, were the pariahs, who were an utterly despised part of the population. They were so despised that a Brahmin who so much as stepped on a pariah's shadow felt contaminated and even had to perform certain purification rites. Thus we see how the whole society was divided into four recognized castes and one that was absolutely unrecognized. Is it really possible that such severe rules were observed in ancient India? They were indeed observed, and strictly so. Even at the time of the Greco-Latin period in Europe, no member of the warrior caste in India would ever have ventured to have a personal opinion about anything in the sacred Vedas. Now, how and why did such a division of human beings arise? It is strange that we find this caste system precisely among the most advanced people of antiquity, among those who had migrated from ancient Atlantis over to India already in comparatively early times, and who had preserved the greatest store of wisdom from ancient Atlantis. Uh, This seems very strange. How can we comprehend something like this? It seems as if it would contradict all the wisdom and goodness in the guidance of the world. For the highest treasure to be preserved by one group alone, while other human beings are predestined by the mere fact of their birth, 
to occupy subordinate positions. This can only be understood, excuse me, this can be understood only if we cast a glance into the secrets of existence. Evolution is possible only by means of differentiation and separation. If everyone had wished to arrive at the degree of wisdom attained in the Brahman caste, no one would have been able to reach it. Divine world guidance is not contradicted by the fact that highest wisdom is not always attained in the same way. To demand this would make no more sense than to demand that an omniscient and omnipotent God should make a triangle with four corners. No God can make a triangle other than with three corners. What is inwardly ordered and determined must also be adhered to by the divine powers. The laws of evolution are as strict as the laws of space. Just as a triangle can have but three corners, so too must evolution occur via differentiation. In order for special qualities to develop in human evolution, certain groups of human beings must be separated off for a time. This is not just a law of human evolution, it is a law of all evolution. Consider the form of the human body. You will certainly admit that the most perfected and valuable parts of the human form are the bones of the head. But how was it possible for these particular bones to become skull bones and envelop the noble organ of the brain? Every human bone is potentially a skull bone. But in order for some to actually develop to this height, to become sheaths for the front or the back of the head, the hip bones or the wrist bones had to remain at a lower stage of development. It is this way everywhere. Progress is possible only if some remain behind while others advance ahead and even overshoot a certain point of development. The Brahmins advanced beyond a certain average point of development while the lowest castes remained behind this point. As the Atlantean catastrophe was beginning, groups of people in Atlantis, the ancient continent located where the Atlantic Ocean is today, gradually migrated eastward and populated the lands now known as Europe, Asia, and Africa. We will not consider today the groups who migrated westward, whose descendants were later discovered in America. The body of people who migrated eastward consisted not just of the four castes who settled in India. There were actually seven castes, and the four who settled in India were actually the four higher castes. Apart from the fifth caste, the pariahs, who form the interstitial substance, as it were, of the population in India, there were also other castes who did not migrate to India, but who remained in various places in Europe, Asia Minor, and also in Africa. Thus, in fact, only the most select castes migrated to India, and those who remained behind in Europe had quite different qualities from those who went on to India. Indeed, one only understands what later took place in Europe when one knows that the more advanced portions of humanity in those days went on to Asia, and that the main body of the population left behind in Europe provided the opportunity for quite particular incarnations. If we wish to understand the nature of the particular souls who incarnated into the bulk of the ancient European population, we must call to mind a certain event that took place in Atlantean times. At a certain time during the Atlantean age, it happened that great secrets of existence were betrayed, secrets that are much more profound than any to which post-Atlantean civilization has attained. These secrets needed to be limited to small circles, but were, instead, betrayed to large parts of the Atlantean population, who thereby acquired occult knowledge for which they were not yet ripe. As a consequence, their souls were strongly driven into a condition of moral decline and only those who later migrated to Asia remained on the path of goodness. Footnote 15, I missed 14 there. The secrets betrayed during the Atlantean age were related to physical reproduction and the formation of races. See Steiner's uh, Outline of Esoteric Science and 
also his, the uh, October 7th lecture of 1917 in the book titled The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness. I guess it's lecture 5, end of footnote. However, you must not imagine that the whole European population consisted only of people in whose souls were individuals who had suffered a moral downfall due to the temptations they had been exposed to during Atlantean times. Scattered throughout this European population were others who had not migrated to Asia, but who had remained behind to act as leaders. Thus over large areas of Europe, Asia Minor and Africa, we have human beings who belonged, as it were, to castes or races that allowed fallen souls to live in their bodies. Footnote. Regarding castes or races, Steiner states that in the first post-Atlantean cultural epoch, a social classification existed based on differences in bodily physiognomy and gesture, and that the caste system developed as these physical differences receded. March 23, 1923, titled The Driving Force of Spiritual Powers in World History, Lecture 6. End of footnote. But besides these, there were also better, more highly developed souls who had not migrated to India and who could take over the leadership. The best regions for those souls who took on the leadership at that time, the period when the Indian and Persian civilizations developed, were the more northerly parts of Europe, the regions where the oldest European mystery centers flourished. Footnote, the European mystery centers in pre-Christian times were those of the Druids in Central Europe and the Trotten in Scandinavia and northern Russia. See Steiner, May 6, 1909, The European Mysteries and Their Initiates. End of footnote. A kind of protective arrangement was instituted to guard against what had happened earlier in ancient Atlantis. In Atlantis, the souls we have described were tempted through being given occult knowledge and wisdom for which they were unprepared. For this reason, in the European mystery centers, the store of wisdom had to be protected and guarded all the more. Those who were the actual teachers of wisdom in Europe in the post-Atlantean period withdrew themselves completely and preserved what they had received as a strict secret. One can thus say that also in Europe there were persons comparable to the Brahmins of Asia, but these European Brahmins were not outwardly known as such by anyone. They kept the sacred secrets absolutely secluded in the mystery centers, so there would be no repetition of what had already happened once in ancient Atlantis. Only through the most careful protection and guardianship of the store of wisdom was it possible for the fallen souls to be able to uplift themselves in certain respects. For, indeed, the differentiation of humanity does not occur in such a manner that one portion is predestined for a lower rank than another. Rather, what is lower at one time should rise upward at a later time, but for this the requisite conditions must be created. In this way it came about that in Europe there were souls who had fallen into temptation, who had lost their moral cohesiveness, while among them a wisdom was working from deeply hidden sources. Footnote, compare Steiner's description of the great initiate known as Scythianus uh, in, in uh, August 31st, 1909, in the book The East and the Light of the West, Lecture 9, and November 14, 1909, in the book, here's just the German, is Die Tieferen Geheimnisse des Menschheitswerdens. End of footnote. Furthermore, in Europe, there were also members of the other castes who had gone to India. In Europe, it was primarily members of the second Indian caste, the warrior caste, who took on positions of power. Whereas the wise teachers, those who corresponded to the Indian Brahmins, withdrew entirely and gave their counsel from hidden stations. The warriors came out among the people to improve and advance them in accordance with the counsels of those European teachers and priests. <clears throat> the second caste wielded the greatest power in ancient Europe, but their life was guided by the wise priests who remained hidden. Thus it came about that the prominent personalities of Europe 
were those who distinguished themselves with the qualities we spoke of yesterday, with courage and fortitude. Whereas in India, wisdom was exalted because the Brahmins interpreted the sacred writings. In Europe, fortitude was held in highest esteem. And the prominent personalities knew only where they must go to get the divine secrets, which they then had to infuse into their courage and fortitude. Looking on the course of European culture over thousands and thousands of years, you see how the souls were gradually improved and elevated. However, because most of the people in Europe were descendants of the population that had fallen into temptation, no proper appreciation for the caste system of India could develop. The people there became all mixed together. A differentiation, a division into castes as in India, did not occur. The only division was between those who were the leaders, an upper class who later developed in the most varied directions, and those who were led. The latter consisted mainly of souls who had to struggle to uplift themselves. If we seek those souls who gradually struggled upward out of this lower class, who raised themselves from their fallen state, we find them chiefly in the European population of which today's history books tell but little. Century after century this population developed itself in order to rise to a higher stage, to recover, as it were, from the heavy setback it had received in the Atlantean period. Thus, whereas Asian culture progressed continuously, in Europe the process was more of a recovery, a reversal of the moral downfall into a gradual moral improvement. Things went on in this way for a long time, and improvement came about only because the human soul contains an extraordinary instinct to imitate. Those who were courageously active among the folk were regarded as the models, as the, in quotes, first, German Fürsten, and were imitated by the others. Thus, through these persons who mingled with the folk as leaders, the morality of all of Europe was raised. <clears throat> With this, however, something else became necessary in European evolution. And to understand this, we must make a clear distinction between the evolution of a single soul and that of a whole race. The two must not be confused. A human soul can develop in such a way that in one incarnation it embodies itself in a particular race, and if it thereby acquire certain qualities, then in a later incarnation it can re-embody itself in an entirely different race. Thus, within the European population of today, we can certainly discover souls whose previous incarnations were in India, Japan or China. Souls do not by any means stay with the same race. Soul evolution is something quite different from racial evolution, which proceeds at its own pace. In ancient Europe, the situation was such that the souls who had fallen into temptation were incarnated in the European races, because they could not enter into the Asiatic races, and these souls were obliged at that time to incarn incarnate repeatedly in the European races. As they improved themselves, however, they gradually passed over into higher races, Souls previously incarnated in quite subordinate races raised themselves to a higher level and could then incarnate in the bodily descendants of the leaders in Europe. As more and more souls developed themselves, the bodily descendants of the leaders became more and more numerous, and the bodily form in which the bulk of the ancient European population had originally incarnated entirely died out as a physical race. The souls, as it were, abandoned the bodies that were formed in a particular way, and these then died out. This was the reason that the lower races had fewer and fewer descendants, while the higher races had more and more. Gradually the lowest levels of the European population completely died out. Footnote, in ancient times the different races fostered different stages in the development of the soul. In the present age this parallelism between the body and the soul has diminished and it will continue to diminish for the remainder of Earth evolution. See Steiner, October, 17th, October 7th, 1917, book The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness, Lecture 5.
End of footnote. This is a very specific process, which we must understand. The souls develop further, but the bodies die out. That is why we must distinguish so carefully between soul evolution and racial evolution. The souls reappear in bodies belonging to higher races, while the bodies of the lower races die out. Such a process, however, does not occur without having effects of its own. When something like this occurs over large regions, when something disappears, as it were, it does not disappear into nothing, but rather disperses and is then present in a different form. You will understand what I mean if you consider that with the dying out of the worst parts of the ancient population of which I have been speaking, the whole region gradually became filled with demonic beings that represented the products of decay of what had died out. The whole of Europe and also of Asia Minor were thus filled with the spiritual products of decay from the dying out of the worst parts of the population. These demons of decay, which were contained in the spiritual atmosphere, as it were, endured for a long time and later exerted an influence in such a way that they permeated people's feelings. Their influence can best be seen at the time of the great migrations, when large masses of people, including Attila and his hordes, came over from Asia and caused great terror among the people in Europe. This terror made the population susceptible to the influences of the demonic beings that still persisted from earlier times. As a consequence of the terror produced by the hordes coming over from Asia, there gradually developed what manifested during the Middle Ages as the epidemic of leprosy. This disease was nothing other than the consequence of the conditions of fear and terror that the people experienced at that time. But these conditions could have had this effect only with people who had been exposed to the demonic forces from the past. I have now described to you how it was possible for people to succumb to a disease that was later practically eradicated in Europe and why it was so widespread during the period I characterized in the first lecture. Thus we see how certain races have died out, as they needed to, because they did not develop upward, but also how we still have their after-effects in the form of human diseases. In the disease of leprosy we see the consequence of soul-spiritual causes. This whole situation had now to be counteracted. Further development in Europe could come about only if what I have described to you were entirely removed. An example of how it was removed was given in yesterday's lecture, where I showed that although the after-effects of immorality were present as the demons of disease, strong moral impulses were present too, as in Francis of Assisi. Because Francis of Assisi had such strong moral impulses, he also gathered around him others who worked in the same way albeit to a lesser degree. At that time, there were actually quite a few who worked in this way. It only did not last for long. How did such a soul power enter into Francis of Assisi? Since we are not gathered here to study external science, but to understand human morality from its occult foundations, we must now examine a few occult truths. Let us then inquire. Whence really came such a soul as that of Francis of Assisi? Such a soul can be understood only if we take the trouble to investigate what was hidden in its depths. Here I must remind you that the old division into castes in India really received its first blow, its first shock through Buddhism, for among the many other things that Buddhism introduced into Asiatic life was the idea that the caste system was not justified. As far as it was possible in Asia, Buddhism recognized each human being as a candidate for the highest. You know, too, that all this was only possible through the outstandingly great and mighty personality of the Buddha. You know that the Buddha became a Buddha in the incarnation we are usually told of, and that in the earlier part of this life he was a bodhisattva which represents the rank just below Buddhahood. In his twenty-ninth year of life, the son of King Sudhadana had deeply experienced the great truths about life and sorrow 
and through this he had acquired the greatness to introduce into Asia the teaching known as Buddhism. We must keep something else in mind, however, which was also connected with this advancement from Bodhisattva to Buddha. When this individuality, who had passed through many incarnations as a Bodhisattva, advanced to the rank of a Buddha, that incarnation became his last incarnation on earth in a physical body. One who is raised from Bodhisattva to Buddha has thereby entered a final incarnation. From then onward, such an individuality works only spiritually. Thus, since the 5th century BCE, the individuality of the Buddha has worked exclusively from spiritual heights. Buddhism, however, has continued. It was able to influence, in a certain way, not just Asiatic life, but also the cultural life of the whole of the then known world. You know how Buddhism has spread in Asia and how many followers it has there, but in a more hidden and veiled form it has also spread within the cultural life of Europe. In particular, the portion of the Buddha's great teaching that related to human equality was especially suited to the population of Europe, because that population was not based on a caste system, but was instead directed toward the idea of equality. Some centuries into the Christian era, a kind of occult school was founded on the shores of the Black Sea. Footnote, Steiner places this school in the 7th and 8th century A.D. See his lecture of December 18, 1912 in the book Esoteric Christianity and the Mission of Christian Rosenkreuz, Lecture 13, and also in the lecture from December 22, 1913 in the book Between Death and Rebirth, Lecture 5. End of footnote. This school was led by people who had as their highest ideal the part of the Buddha's teaching that we have just characterized. But the teachers in this school could illuminate the Buddha's teaching with a new light, as it were, because they had also absorbed the Christian impulse. If I were to describe this school on the Black Sea as it is viewed by the occultist, and you will understand me best if I do so, I must do this in the following manner. Pupils were gathered there who initially had teachers on the outer physical plane. These pupils were instructed in doctrines and principles which had originated in Buddhism, but which were permeated by the impulses that came into the world through Christianity. <clears throat> then, when the pupils were sufficiently prepared, the deeper forces of wisdom within them were brought forth, so that they acquired a clairvoyant vision of the spiritual world. One of the first things attained by the pupils of this occult school after the teachers on the physical plane had accustomed them to it, was the ability to recognize those who no longer descended to the physical plane. In this way they came to know the Buddha, for example. Indeed, these occult pupils learned to know the Buddha, quote, face to face, close quote, if one may speak in this way of his spiritual being. Thus the Buddha continued to work spiritually in the occult pupils, in this manner he brought his power down to the physical plane, since he himself no longer descended to physical incarnation on the physical plane. The pupils in this occult school were divided into two groups, according to their degree of maturity. This refers to those pupils who had already gone through the preparatory stage, so that most of them could clairvoyantly experience a being who strove with all its might to bring its impulses through to the physical world, even though it did not itself descend to the physical plane. They thus experienced all the secrets of the Buddha and all that he wished to accomplish. Most of these pupils remained clairvoyants as such, but there were some who not only had knowledge and psychic clairvoyance, but who also developed a spiritual element which cannot be separated from a certain humility a certain highly evolved capacity for devotion. These were able, then, precisely in this occult school, to receive the Christ impulse to a tremendous degree. They could also become clairvoyant in such a way that they became the steadily chosen successors of Paul and received the Christ impulse directly into their life. 23. 
uh, excuse me, footnote, St. Paul, born Saul of Tarsus, approximately A.D. 1 to 67, became the foremost Christian apostle of the Gentiles after experiencing the risen Christ in the spiritual atmosphere of the earth. See Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, and Steiner, October 12, 1911, in the book From Jesus to Christ, lecture 8, and a footnote. These two groups went out from this school, one which had the impulse to spread the teachings of the Buddha, though they did not use his name, and a second one which also received the Christ impulse. Now, the difference between these two groups did not appear so strongly in that particular incarnation, but only in the next. The pupils who had come as far as the Buddha impulse, but who had not received the Christ impulse, became the teachers of human equality and brotherhood. (laughs) On the other hand, the pupils who had received the Christ impulse were such that in their next physical incarnation, the Christ impulse worked on further, so that they not only could teach, though they did not regard this as their chief task, but could work more especially through their moral power. One such pupil of the occult school, on the Black Sea, was born in his next incarnation, as Francis of Assisi. It is not surprising, then, that there lived in him the wisdom he had received about brotherhood and human equality, about the need to love all human beings equally, and that his soul was permeated and strengthened by the Christ impulse. How did this Christ impulse work on further in Francis of Assisi? It acted in such a way that when he was placed in a population in which the old demons of disease were especially active, the Christ impulse approached the diseased demons through him and absorbed their evil substance into itself, thereby removing it from the people. Earlier, the Christ impulse had embodied itself in this substance in such a way that it appeared to Francis of Assisi as a vision, as the vision in which he saw the palace and was called to take up the burden of poverty. This was the point at which the Christ impulse again became alive in him, and it then streamed out from him and laid hold of the diseased demons. His moral forces became so strong thereby that they could remove the harmful spiritual substances that accompanied the disease we have mentioned. Only in this manner was it possible to bring to higher development what I have described as the after-effect of the old Atlantean element to sweep the evil substances away from the earth and purify the European world. Look at the life of Francis of Assisi and notice how remarkably it unfolded. He is born in the year 1182. We know that the first years of life of a human being are largely devoted to the development of the physical body. The physical body manifests chiefly what comes via external heredity. Hence, there appears in him what he inherited from the European population. His own special qualities gradually appear as he develops his etheric body between the ages of seven and fourteen. Footnote. Clairvoyant observation distinguishes several higher bodies in addition to the physical body. The etheric body is the body of forces that endows a physical body with life. Plants have these two bodies. Animals and human beings have, in addition, an astral body as the basis of their consciousness, and human beings have an ego body as the basis of their self-consciousness. In human development, these bodies are born, that is, become fully independent, at different times. The physical body is developed from birth until age seven, the change of teeth. The etheric body is born and developed between age seven to fourteen, puberty the astral body from age 14 to 21, and the ego body after age 21. For further details, see Steiner titled Theosophy, Chapter 1, also titled The Education of the Child in the Light of Anthroposophy, and March 14, 1910, misstated 1909, Metamorphoses of the Soul, Lecture 5. End of footnote. From... From the etheric body especially, the quality appears that had worked directly in him 
as the Christ impulse in the mystery center by the Black Sea. Footnote. Compare Steiner's description of a basic law of karma and reincarnation. Quote, what is present in the astral body in one life, as learning, becomes an attribute of the etheric body in the next life, a habit. If you meet a person with a certain praiseworthy habit, a habit that repeatedly comes to expression, this indicates that the corresponding concepts were absorbed or developed by this person in the earlier incarnation. This is from a lecture October 15, 1906, entitled Karma and Details of the Law of Karma. End of footnote. Then as his astral body comes to manifestation after age 14, the Christ force becomes particularly enlivened in him as his astral body takes up what has remained united with the atmosphere of the earth since the mystery of Golgotha. Footnote. At the crucifixion on Golgotha, the macrocosmic Christ impulse that had lived in Jesus of Nazareth passed into the whole earth. See Steiner, May 26th and 31, 1908, The Gospel of St. John, Lectures 7 and 12, and October 1st, 1911, titled The Etherization of the Blood, also entitled The Reappearance of Christ in the Etheric, Lecture 9. Compare here Steiner's description of one of the occult means by which the Christ impulse is propagated, namely through a spiritual multiplication of the bodies of Jesus of Nazareth. Steiner states that the astral body of Francis of Assisi was interwoven with a copy of the astral body of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is from the February 15th, March 7th, April 6th and 11th, and May 16th, 1909, from the book titled The Principle of Spiritual Economy, Lectures 2, 3, 6, 8, and 9, I believe, respective. Note also the close connection between the forces in Jesus of Nazareth's astral body and the spiritual forces of the Buddha. See Steiner's lecture cycle, The Gospel of St. Luke, compare all, okay, and a footnote. For Francis of Assisi was a personality also permeated by the outer Christ force, because in his previous incarnation he had sought the Christ force where it was to be found, in that special center of initiation. Here we see how the process of differentiation works in humanity. Differentiation must come about, but what is pushed downward through earlier events is later uplifted through very special occurrences in the course of human evolution. There was another occasion when a particularly important uplifting took place in the evolution of humanity, one which exoterically will always remain incomprehensible. People have given up trying to understand it, but esoterically it can be fully explained. Those who had raised themselves up most quickly from the lowest strata of the Western population, who had gradually overcome their passage through the lowest strata, but who had not developed their intellect very much and had remained relatively simple people, the most select of these, as it were, who needed only to be uplifted at the appointed time by a mighty impulse that reflected itself in them, they are known to us as the Twelve Apostles of Jesus. <laughs> they were the extract of the lower castes, who were diverted and did not go on to India. The substance for the disciples of Christ Jesus had to be taken from these castes. I am not saying anything here about the previous or subsequent incarnations of the Apostle individualities, only about the physical ancestry of the bodies into which the Apostle personalities were incarnated. One must always distinguish between the incarnation lineage and the lineage of physical heredity. Footnote, almost nothing is known of the physical ancestry of the apostles. It is assumed that most of them were from the region of Galilee. Judas was from Judea. Compare Steiner's comment, quote, Galilee was the region where peoples of every race and tribe had mixed together. The term Galilean means mixed breed or mongrel. Close quote from May 23, 1908, The Gospel of St. John, Lecture 5. End of footnote. We have now found the source of the moral power of that unique personality, Francis of Assisi. 
Do not say that it would be too much to expect people to adopt such extraordinary ideals as existed with Francis of Assisi. What I have said was certainly not said in order to recommend that anyone become a Francis of Assisi, not at all. I just wish to point out by means of a particularly striking example how moral power can enter into a human being, whence it can originate, and how it must be understood as something very special that was originally present in the human being. However, from the whole spirit of what I have said up to now, you may gather what we have also often emphasized regarding other forces in human evolution, namely that humanity has gone through a descent and is now undertaking an ascent. If we journey back in human evolution, we pass through the post-Atlantean age to the Atlantean catastrophe, then to the Atlantean age, and then further back to the Lemurian age. We thus arrive at the starting point of earthly humanity, at a time when humanity was much closer to the divine, not only with regard to the qualities of spirit, but also with regard to morality. At the beginning of earth evolution, we do not find immorality, but rather morality. Morality is an original divine gift, part of the original content of human nature. Just as spiritual power was part of human nature when humanity had not descended so far, in truth a large part of immorality entered human evolution in just the way I have described, by means of the betrayal of higher mysteries during the ancient Atlantean age. Thus, we cannot speak about morality as if it were something that humanity first had to develop. Morality is something that lies at the foundation of the human soul and has been hidden and suppressed only by later civilization. When we look at the matter in the right light, we cannot even say that immorality came into the world through folly. Rather, it came into the world because the mysteries were betrayed to human beings who were still immature. In this way people were tempted and then succumbed and degenerated. In order for them to rise again, you can gather this from today's presentation, something was needed that would sweep away everything that had set itself against the moral impulse in the human soul. Let me put this another way. Let us suppose we have before us a criminal, someone we call immoral. On no account may we say that there are no moral impulses in this immoral person. They are there and we shall find them if we go to the foundation of his or her soul. There is no human soul, with the exception of black magicians, who are not our concern here, in which there is not a foundation of goodness. If a person is bad, it is because what has arisen in the course of time as spiritual error has overlain the goodness. Human nature is not bad. Originally it was good. Concrete observation of human nature shows us that in its deepest nature it is good, and that it was the subsequent spiritual errors that diverted people from the path of goodness. Therefore, in the course of time, people must correct these moral errors. The errors themselves, and also their consequences, must be rectified. However, where the consequences of immorality are so severe that demons of disease exist, then supermoral forces like those of Francis of Assisi, must also be active. The betterment of human beings always involves eliminating their spiritual errors. But what is needed for this? Take everything I have now told you and condense it into one basic mood or feeling. Let the facts speak to you. Let them speak to your feelings and try to gather them together into one fundamental feeling. You will then say to yourself, quote, What attitude toward other people does one need to have? One needs to believe in their original goodness, in the original goodness of each human being. Close quote. This is the first thing we must say if we attempt to speak at all about morality, that there is an unfathomable goodness at the foundation of human nature. That is what Francis of Assisi said to himself. 
and when he was approached by some of those afflicted with the dreadful disease of leprosy, then as a good Christian of that time, he said somewhat the following to himself, quote, Such a disease is in some respect the result of sin, but because sin is spiritual error, because the disease is the consequence of spiritual error, it must therefore be cancelled and removed by a strong opposite spiritual power. Close quote. Thus Francis of Assisi saw how in some respects the penalty of sin revealed itself outwardly on the sinner. But he also saw the goodness of human nature, the divine spiritual powers at the foundation of every human soul. This tremendous faith in the goodness of every human soul, even in those being punished, was what especially distinguished Francis of Assisi. Through this faith it was possible for the power that is opposed to sin to appear in his soul, the power of love that strengthens, comforts, and indeed even heals. And no one who has fully developed the impulse of faith in the original goodness of human nature can do otherwise than love this human nature as such. It is these two fundamental impulses, to begin with, that can establish a truly moral life. First, the faith in the divine at the foundation of every human soul. And second, the boundless love of humanity that springs from this faith. For only this boundless love could lead Francis of Assisi to the ailing, the crippled, and those stricken with the plague. And then there is a third thing that is necessarily founded on the first two. A person who has a foundation of faith in the goodness of the human soul and in the love of human nature can do no other than say what arises from the combination of the original goodness of the human soul and active love justifies a perspective on the future wherein every soul, no matter how far it has fallen from spiritual heights, may be led back again to these heights. This is the third impulse, the hope that every human soul can find its way back to the divine spiritual world. We can say that Francis of Assisi heard these three impulses expressed countless times, that they were repeatedly brought to his attention during his initiation in the Colchian mysteries by the Black Sea. I'm not sure how to pronounce that word, this is the reader. Colchian, I'm pronouncing it C-O-L-C-H-I-A-N, Colchian. End of aside. We can also say, however, that in his life as Francis of Assisi, he preached very little of faith and love. Instead, he was himself an embodiment of this faith and this love. In him, these appeared as a living symbol before the world. Foremost, of course, was that which really works. For faith does not work, and neither does hope. These one must indeed have, but only love works. Love stands in the center, and love is what carried the actual moral development of humanity toward the divine during this incarnation of Francis of Assisi. Footnote, compare St. Paul, quote, In a word, there are three things that last forever, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of them all is love. 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13, end of footnote. This love, which we know was a result of his initiation in the mysteries of Colchis, again, aside, spelled C-O-L-C-H-I-S, end of aside, how have we seen it unfold in him? We saw that the warlike virtues of the ancient European spirit appeared in Francis of Assisi, that he was a warlike boy. But in his individuality, permeated as it was by the Christ impulse, courage and fortitude, were transformed into active, effective love. We see the ancient courage and fortitude resurrected, as it were, in the love that we encounter in Francis of Assisi. Courage transformed into spirituality, spiritualized ancient fortitude. These are love. It is interesting to notice how much of what has just been said also corresponds to the outer historical development of humanity. If we go back a few centuries into pre-Christian times, into the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, we find the Greek philosopher Plato, who wrote, among other things, 
about morals, about human virtues. He described them in such a way that we can recognize that he held back the highest secrets, but that what he could say he put into the mouth of Socrates. Writing at a time in European history in which the Christ impulse was not yet active, Plato describes what he views as the highest virtues, the virtues the Greeks felt a moral person should have above all else. To begin with, Plato describes three primary virtues. We shall also get to know a fourth one. The first virtue is that of wisdom. Plato regards wisdom as such as a virtue. We have seen wisdom justified as the basis of moral life from the most varied directions. In India the wisdom of the Brahmins was the basis of life. In Europe the wisdom was more hidden, but it lived in the northern mysteries, where the European Brahmins were engaged in remedying what had been damaged through the betrayal in ancient Atlantis. As we shall see tomorrow, wisdom does indeed stand behind all morality. Then, in keeping with the mysteries from which he drew, Plato also describes courage as a virtue, which we find mainly in the European population. Footnote. Plato was connected with the Dionysian mysteries, Dionysian mysteries. See Frederick Hebel, titled The Gospel of Hellas, Chapter 5, and Steiner, titled Christianity as Mystical Fact and the Mysteries of Antiquity, Chapter 4. End of footnote. As a third virtue, he designates temperance or self-discipline, German Besonnenheit, Mäßigkeit. In other words, the opposite of a passionate cultivation of the lower human drives. Those are the three primary virtues of Plato, wisdom, courage or fortitude, and temperance or self-discipline, the curbing of the sensual drives. In addition, Plato describes the harmonious balancing of these three virtues as a fourth virtue, which he calls justice or righteousness, German Gerechtigkeit. Here you have one of the most eminent European minds of pre-Christian times describing what were regarded then as the most important qualities of human nature. Later in the European population, courage or fortitude becomes permeated by the Christ impulse and by what we call the ego. What appears with Plato as the virtue of courage is thereby spiritualized and thus becomes love. This is what is important that we should see how new moral impulses enter into humanity, how what was formerly regarded as I have described today later becomes something quite different. Thus, unless we wish to fly in the face of Christian morality, we may not list the virtues as wisdom, fortitude, temperance and justice, for then we could be answered, if you had all these virtues and yet had not love, never would you enter the kingdom of heaven. Let us keep in mind the epoch in which, as we have seen, an impulse of such stature was poured into humanity that wisdom and courage were spiritualized and reappeared as love. We shall continue tomorrow to consider the further development of the virtues, and in so doing we shall come to see the particular moral mission of the Theosophical Movement for our present time.